Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Mary Papazian, uh, a good friend and a longtime uh, supporter of Armenian causes and issues. We happen to be on the plane together and share why we were both on the plane. We didn't, I don't think, talk about that at that moment. Well, I first, it's wonderful to be here and to, to talk with you today. Uh, we both, I know, have long been um, a part of building Armenia and Armenian institutions, whether in the United States, uh, from where we come, uh, and here in Armenia. And so, uh, having been grounded for three, three years with COVID, uh, there was a great deal taking place this week in Armenia. And uh, I came for two things. One was the uh, Smart Gate Conference that was around the science and technology convergence. And the other, which is what we're here doing today, which is the Fast Global Innovation Forum, a really important uh, space for Armenia to think about the future. And uh, it was important to be here. And I assume that's why you're here, and it's certainly why I'm here as well. Uh, just like you, one of many things, uh, I will be working on the Armenian Educational Foundation Scholarship uh, recipient recognitions, many of whom are, are war survivors, injured or otherwise. So the next one won't be, what can I say, as uh, positive a feeling as this has been, but I know their future will be positive with all of our support. Now, our parents have known each other for <laughs> forever, and they, were brought together by a lot of Armenian causes, but you went to the Farahian High School in California, Los Angeles area. So did my brother. Your mother was a uh, teacher there. My parents were on the PTA and board, and that just brought them together. But that also brought us together as well just kind of reminisce the whole issue of being a Farahian high school student. It was, um, being a student there was really a, a, a surprise actually in my life. Uh, my mother's family is, has been in Los Angeles since the early 20th century. They were in Fresno, my grandfather was born in Fresno in 1903 and they moved to Los Angeles in 1905. So my mother's family was one of the first 10 Armenian families in Los Angeles. And she grew up with the community. Um, we, my, my father came from Greece and met, they met at UCLA, they married. Um, and my mother happened to meet a young uh, Armenian professor or graduate student at the time uh, named Richard Hovanesian. And Richard or Uncle Richard to me, I've known him my whole life, um, became a very close friend. Uh, my father grew up in an Armenian community in Greece, but for my mother, third generation, it was a very different environment. But she became close to Richard. She edited his first books. Uh, and um, between all of that, their involvement in the Armenian Monument Council, which brought uh, the whole community together in the mid-60s, around the 50th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. I carried the candle at the groundbreaking for that in 1967. I still remember. I, I have probably photographs. stood there and watched. You were probably there. We probably saw each other every April 24th at those at those commemorations as well. But I grew up going to public schools, and uh, again, my mother was an American Armenian of a third generation, so it was a very different uh, upbringing than many of my classmates in uh, at Fedayan. She'd been a teacher. She was brought in to teach English and history. And we happened to move at the time. And the principal of the school was our neighbor. And because of that, we actually started at Fed uh, It was a very small place. Uh, there were fewer than 200 students. We were in an old house. Uh, it was a dream that was just starting to get its legs. And uh, I have to say, it was probably one of the most uh, special times of my life. We were a family, but we had an extraordinary group of teachers uh, who prepared us well for what was to come. And I still see people who are from that time, and I think it, it really connected me to the community in a way that has stayed with me for the rest of my life. I was envious because I was ahead of you, obviously, age-wise, but my brother had the privilege of attending Farahian, 
And I remember everyone calling Mr. Njejikian Khent <laughs> because he had this vision yeah. he, to have Armenian schools in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And with it began the history of Armenian schools, which now have grown uh, extensively across the United States. Uh, I think that also probably brought us all together with serving our community. So skipping years, yeah. decades later, uh, you have been with FAST. I have known about FAST. I serve on the United World College's Dilly John board, mm -hmm. but I had never connected with them till the recent fundraiser in Los Angeles and the request that I become a part of FAST. So tell me what led you to FAST and uh, I'm certainly impressed with what I have seen and learned in the last two days. What about you? Yeah, I have been a part of FAST and been on the advisory uh, uh, board for a number of years now, I think four years. And I was always interested in, and had been working because I, I had roles, uh, leadership roles in academia, in partnerships between the universities I was uh, serving in and universities here in Armenia. And when I came to um, my, the, the position I most recently held as president of San Jose State, this was a university that was known and is known for science and technology, as well as many other things, but as a public university in Silicon Valley, we're always thinking about the future, about innovation, about technology, and it, it really aligned very much with many of the goals I was seeing in Armenia when I would travel here and talk with people about future uh, strategies. I was also aware of the history of Armenia as a place, uh, even in Soviet times, that was very accomplished in science and technology. So in thinking about building a country and building institutions and ensuring an ecosystem and education that prepared our people for the future, uh, science and technology was always a one element that was at the heart of it. Now I marry that to the humanities, I think that's an important partnership, but uh, clearly this is an area that, that's critical. And I. I came to know some of the, the leaders in FAST. I knew, uh, of course, Rupen and, and Nubar from, from other uh, ex times being in Armenia. And I was introduced to Armen uh, Ujian, and he, Rujin, and he is, as the, the CEO of FAST, is a very impressive person. And he outlined for me uh, the vision of FAST and what it was really trying to do to, uh, with excellence, with, with real innovative strategies, um, to come up with some programs in education and research and, and in commercialization uh, to really build the ecosystem. And I thought, you know, there's a lot I can do uh, to contribute to this. And, um, and so I jumped on board. So glad you did. And Armin also has become a close friend of ours and I can see the magnetism. And so interesting that two women in education uh, I've had the privilege of serving on the CSU trustees, which you were a president of, and C California's Community College Board of Governors, and other gubernatorial mm -hmm. advisory commissions and boards. At that time, Armenian women were more engaged in being homemakers. Mm -hmm. As I grew up, the whole challenge of becoming a model for women as they were entering their choice of workforce was quite important for me. Uh, I became a women's advocate and uh, today as I sit in the sessions, it breaks my heart to see mostly men in the fields that are the future of not only our nation but globally. What is it that you think we can do to bring about not only recognition, but engagement of women in the whole future, whether it be AI technologies or the world that lies ahead? Well, the, the challenge, of course, is not simply here in Armenia. This is a challenge that is a global issue. Uh, we certainly see it in the United States. And I, uh, at San Jose State, where I served for, for five plus years, we had a very large engineering program and a large computer science program. And uh, we had many other programs in the social sciences and the humanities. Uh, we found that um, the 
disproportionate number of men and women in the engineering courses um, is still true today. And so we are always thinking about ways to find some gender balance in all of this. And when, when it has to start very young. It has to start in the lower schools, engaging uh, women in science and mathematics, uh, thinking about um, the, the problems that can be, and the fun, actually, that can come out of working in these fields. Um, we have seen, for example, women in science tend to veer toward the biological sciences. So when you look at medical schools, for example, and I have two daughters and my oldest just graduated from medical school, um, and she was a biology major, you see actually more women now entering medical school than men. It's a slight increase. So there is change happening, but in what they traditionally call the hard sciences, physics, math, computer science, there's still a lag. And so that's part of what we're seeing. Um, and I, I think that the secret is uh, intentionality. It is ensuring that um, we support women who are showing interest in this field. I actually am very proud of FAST, for example, because many of the, the leadership in FAST are women, very accomplished, with vision, with, with um, tremendous skills, uh, who are managing uh, many of the programs. And there is a pipeline here, and it's a pipeline. And so we're not far left along in the pipeline, but too often it's a leaky pipeline. That there are points at every step where women drop out. And sometimes it's the personal challenges of life, right? Trying to manage families as well as, as work. And sometimes it's just uh, implicit bias uh, where, where men are promoted um, and women are, are, are working hard but they don't receive the promotions. And I think the more we have women in leadership positions, the more important it is for us to be on boards, whether it's uh, boards of organizations like FAST or boards of companies. And, and one of the things I'm looking at is actually moving to being on boards of, of um, uh, companies and corporations. California passed a law, I and then of course it was, it was challenged, but the, it's very clear that when you have women in those leadership positions, you change the conversation. But it can't be one woman. It has to be groups of women, because any representation of one or even two is not enough to change the conversation. So I would say this, here in Armenia, it is extraordinary to see the energy of the, the younger women, the Gen Zs, who are in our universities here in Hayastan, who are actually engaged in the startup culture. Uh, if you go to the incubator in Gumri, the secondary, the second largest city and the secondary uh, sort, uh, center of technology, in their incubator, most of the startups are founded by women. So there is a culture here in Armenia of women who are really thinking this way. They have business experience, they have technology experience, and what we'll have to do is make sure we provide them the supports so that their companies grow. I'll leave it with one last thing. The investments of funding from the venture capitalist firms and angel investors for women in Silicon Valley is 3%. All right. So part of the problem is women are not receiving the funds they need to grow their companies. And it's many of the people we've seen on the stage here at FAST are founders and leaders and chairs of companies. And so if the funding, funding is key. So we also have to change the way we invest in these support more women um, uh, founded venture capitalist firms so that those investments and those angel dollars can go into women-owned companies. Perfect answer. Uh, I couldn't agree any further than what you've already said. FAST's team is truly strengthened and enhanced by the number of women, but talented women, mm -hmm. that comprise the support team that our men has. Uh, what I fear is that we are still in Armenia, and that seems to be my major concern right now, not giving women the belief system that they need, that there's an opportunity for you any place you choose or wish to be. And I think what we need to do is get more people to think like our men, to incorporate and give the positions to women that will allow them to move up to the next level and hopefully create even more. Uh, I know these are difficult times for Armenia and I'm sure you're getting the same kind of questions that I keep getting, uh, whether through social media or family calls. How is everything? How is everyone holding up? 
what do you predict for the near future? Well, before I answer that question, I want to I say one last thing about our previous uh, topic, which Great. is about women. If you look at the ministries here in Armenia too, and I've, I've seen this over the years, many of the deputies are women, but the ministers are, are not. not. We've had very few ministers at that level who are women. What I hope happens, and we have to be intentional about it, is we can nurture and support these women who are deputies into moving into the leadership. So I'm optimistic that if we uh, really focus on building their leadership skills, that they will have the opportunity um, as the years unfold to take some of those leadership roles. I think that will make a huge difference. Predictions about Armenia, it's, it's uh, a fool to predict. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say is this, um, I take the long view. We have been around as a people for over 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. We have had many moments in our history where it looked like we would disappear. And for some reason or another, we never have. So I like to believe that there's something inside us that says we're never going to give up, that we will find a way to survive. There's no question we're in a challenging environment uh, here in the Caucasus. We have difficult friends. The geopolitics is against us in many ways. But we aren't without our strengths as well. One of them is the commitment of the people, that there is what I sense here. When I wrote to uh, the you know, people here at FAST and in the other organizations I was a meeting with before I came and I said, so should I come? What do you think? And they said, it's more important than ever that we put on these things. We need a strong Armenia. We need to build it because having a strong Armenia in terms of its economy and the Armenian economy grew, I think, about 14% um, in, in the three quarters of this year, one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So there's a lot happening here that is, is good. Um, the, the, all the democratic indicators at, with Freedom House, uh, freedom of the press and the like, the, the free elections uh, also are going in the positive direction and that people are noticing that out in the world. And I think that you know, our being here is a way of saying we believe and we need to work in partnership with um, our compatriots here in Armenia to continue to build the infrastructure, the human capital, and the strength and the democratic institutions of this country. Because that's ultimately what will give us the best chance for survival. Now, what will happen geopolitically is very complicated. You, you use the past to inform the future. Um, I, I uh, do believe that we have gained uh, some awareness in the world in terms of what's happening here. And I think our job is to continue to, to keep open the possibility of a future and as things evolve, be able to act on them in a way that's in Armenia's best interests, but also in, in um, the world's best interests. And I would concur with you in the fact that uh, if we survived a genocide, we will survive this as well. If our viewers include our diasporan friends and family, I think the message that you've just given is there's not only hope, but there's a way. And we have to be a part of that will and way for survival here. Uh, when we were leaving, my husband and I were asked, this is no time for you to be going. And our response was, yes, it is. You should not only be there on the good days and partying and enjoying life, but you should be there on days where our people are concerned. And if it's a good place for two million to continue to do what they do and be strong, then it's a good place for a couple of hundred thousand of us to also visit and make sure that economic trend, which they're showing 14% growth, is, uh, is actually happening and we're helping it. So we have now come. Uh, we're both of a certain age, uh, you a bit younger. Why? Why do we persist on fighting these battles and doing these things and volunteering in multiple communities, what drives us? Because here in Armenia, what I notice that after a certain age, women kind of are not as engaged. Mm -hmm. And that's also true in most places in the US. You retire, you go on with just traveling and enjoying your family. But here we are, we're, 
were like two strong women trying to go up against the metal wall. Well, here's what I would say. Um, first, I think it's, um, it, it's important because, and to our diasporan audience, this is about the survival of the diaspora too. Uh, let's be very clear about this. Um, diasporas without a center simply don't survive. And we as Armenians have had diasporas in the past, and I always reference the diaspora in Poland. We had Armenians in Poland for several hundred years. Now we have uh, remnants of churches uh, that harken back to those days, but the community has you know, dissipated, assimilated, and no longer is there. There is no doubt in my mind that without a strong Armenia, centering all of us around the globe, that uh, the diasporas too will, will slowly over time disappear. It may take a hundred years for that to happen, but let's not fool ourselves. It will happen. And so it's important for the diaspora to be a part of Armenia because this is where our lifeblood ultimately is. It's important for Armenia to be engaged in the diaspora and in partnership with the diaspora for the very same reason, for its survival. And we have this unique situation where I think I think it's, it's closer to 3 million. I like to still play with that number. It's probably 2.75. 2 um, but there's, what, estimates are something 10 or 11 million Armenians globally. So more than double outside of Armenia. We are a global nation in two parts. Again, not the first time. Remember when the Cilician Armenian Kingdom, uh, we moved our kingdom to Cilicia back how many hundreds of years ago. We should know our own history. And so I think what drives us is um, first, our mothers. I knew your mother and she was quite a force of nature and I, my mother was the same. And I think we had role models there that you can continue to make a difference. And ultimately, it's for the next generation. It's for our children's generation, our grandchildren's generation. Uh, it's to make sure that the incredibly rich heritage we have been so blessed to have inherited uh, continues for the future generation. And that means bringing all we've experienced, learned, um, and whatever knowledge we might have uh, to work, as I say, in partnership uh, it, with Armenia. We are true partners with different perspectives, and it will take all of us working together to create a strong global Armenian nation. And we will. To paraphrase uh, Saroyan, uh, when two Armenians meet, when you and I meet, we will continue to talk about how we can contribute and make things better, not only for our homeland, but also in the diaspora. This has been great fun. How creative to allow two speakers and uh, two women from the diaspora to have this opportunity to chat. And I know as we walk out the store, the dialogue will continue and it will continue every time two Armenians meet. So thank you for doing this. Oh, and thank you, and thank you for all that you've done and contributed for so long. I, uh, you've always been a role model to me as well, so thank I'm you. grateful. Thank you so much.